Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Roy Furr. He's quickly becoming one of the modern legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. He works primarily with high-growth entrepreneurial direct response marketing companies, including financial and business publishers. His clients include companies on the Inc. Magazine's list of fastest-growing businesses, Boardroom Inc., AWAI, and many more. Roy developed a reputation for helping clients break sales records, which he's going to talk about today. He's going to give us some of his best tips, tricks, and he even forced, and I have to ask about this in the intro, but he even forced a client for the first time in over 10 years in business to stop sales of a new product to keep up with the demand. And you know, we have a lot to cover, but I'm going to go back to that. He's helped generate seven-figure sales volumes in weeks. He's also written a book with one of the, America's top copywriter, Bob Bly, on the world's most advanced marketing testing and optimization technique called the Taguchi Testing Handbook, which I'm going to ask about too. And this one, if it doesn't blow your mind, you need to just rethink this again. He's a copywriter behind the Titans of Direct Response Sales Letter, which is one of, arguably, one of the most epic copywriting events of all time with all the who's who of copywriting. Roy, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thank you, Jeremy, and I'm uh, looking forward to, to our time here. So who is, tell me about some of the who's who of copywriters who will be at this event that you wrote the copywriting behind. Yeah, um, so so first off, this was an event that was put together by Brian Kurtz of Boardroom, yeah. and um, and I had gone to his, his event last year with Perry Marshall, and and before then and, and also after then developed a pretty good relationship with Brian, and he and I uh, one of the nicest people in the world. Yeah. Oh my goodness, one of the most most generous people in, in direct marketing yeah. too. Um, but but he and I he and I uh, had gone back and forth, kind of brainstorming for what this year's event was going to be. Uh, I just I chose to be really engaged. I liked having the conversations with Brian, and um, and and I guess I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here because because I thought we might talk about this yeah, later. But let's talk about it. I want to save that. I want to talk about it later. Okay. But I want right. to know just so people so, give people an idea okay. of who's going to be there, just so they kind of know the speakers and the caliber of the event. All right. All right. Well, let's let's uh, let's dive in with the list. We have uh, Dan Kennedy, who is uh, one of the big headliners for the event, and this one came in at the eleventh hour. This one's super exciting for for serious students of direct response. Mm -hmm. Gary Bensavenga. Yeah. Uh, now it's now huge. he's yeah. he's he's spoken publicly two times. One time he gave an interview with Ken McCarthy uh, right before he retired, and then he did a five thousand dollar person seminar, um, and. Then took a vow of silence, basically, but he's coming back out for this. Yes. Uh, we have uh, Greg Rinker of Guthy Rinker. We have Jay Abraham, Joe Sugarman. And just uh, for people who haven't heard of that, that's the um, marketing behind um, what's proactive. The, proactive. I, I yeah. mean, that's that's exactly. the biggest. Uh, but yeah. also uh, Victoria Principal Secret, uh, which is a huge cosmetics brand. They're 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 one of the biggest. Huge. Potentially the biggest uh, infomercial company out there. It's it's a two million dollar a year direct response business. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. I, I hit Jay Abraham, Joe Sugarman, uh, Perry Marshall is going to be there uh, again this year. Ken McCarthy, who has pretty much stopped speaking now, but um, almost anybody who's a guru in internet marketing today is either a student or a student of a student of Ken's. Uh, he put on the very first internet marketing seminar. And uh, then he taught his system seminar for 10 years and, and has basically retired, but he's coming back out of retirement for this. Yeah. Um, and uh, Fred Katona, who a lot of people in our industry don't know, but he is yeah, the titan cool. of, of direct response radio. He grew Priceline.com from zero to, I think it was a $20 billion valuation in 18 months, wow. uh, largely on the back of direct response radio. Yeah. And then... Um, uh, and then what Brian is calling the Mount Boardroom's current Mount Rushmore of copywriters, the top four mm -hmm. copywriters, just purely by results. Um, Eric Betchel, uh, Arthur Johnson, Paris Lampropoulos, David Deutsch are all coming out to, to do a panel on uh, basically yeah. how they've sold over a billion dollars worth of, of published products by direct mail. Yeah. Um, and Brian's uh, own personal mastermind group, uh, Michael Fishman, Jim Quick, 
and Ryan Lee are also coming out yeah. uh, for a special panel. Yeah. And so it's, I mean, it is the biggest direct response event of the yeah. decade. It's, it's one of those once in a lifetime things. Talk about pressure. You yeah. write the, the copywriting for all these people, which we'll get into. I just had to mention that. I know that you put that, you know, we will talk about that for some of the proud moments and we'll get into detail, but yeah, you know, I'm excited to hear some of your big lessons, big mistakes along the journey. It's not always, you know, perfect. Um, yeah. And before we get into some of the big lessons and mistake that, that you'll talk about, I have to ask about were you forced a client for 10 years to stop sales <laughs> because they had to keep up with demand? What happened? Oh, this is this is AWAI, and they are um, one of the biggest publishers in in copywriting and, and a good client of mine. Um, they 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 teach people uh, how to become professional copywriters, how to do what I do, yeah. um, and also a lot of a lot of um, opportunities around the direct response and copywriting industry. Well, um, they they just they had uh, kind of uncovered this this opportunity where the, this this woman um, gets paid to do research for copywriters, um, and and. Uh, Basically, we put together a, a, a product and a promotion around what she did and around uh, this this opportunity of that. Yeah. And I worked with uh, a lot of people know him as Michael Masterson. Uh, sure. he, he now writes under the name Mark Ford, which is his real name, um, but put together a promotion with him uh, to to present this opportunity to people. And uh, it it was such a big success that they actually just had to shut off sales for a few months. Um, they said, Oh, we'll never do that. You know, it launched and they're like, wow, this is, this is working so phenomenally. And then, um, I said, well, you know, at some point you might want to actually shut off sales cause you don't want too many people uh, getting started with this at the same time. And, uh, they said, no, we'd never do that. We've never done that. And, and then, yeah, eventually, uh, they did, they did have to shut it down. Um, and it's funny when you have to do something like that. Oftentimes, you get as many sales in like the 24 hours after you announce that it's shutting down in 24 hours as you did during the entire launch yeah. period. And it was completely unintentional. Like it wasn't a gimmick. It wasn't right. anything like that. It was just, hey, this is selling so well that we need to take a step back yeah. and make sure um, that everybody is is being taken yeah. care of. And so we shut it down. And then it took a couple months before we launched it up again. Um, but that it was just a phenomenal success. Yeah. Um, so and, what worked and, so well with that? What worked well that other people can do? Because obviously that's everyone's dream. You just put put a message out there and you just are slam booked. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think it was the uniqueness of the opportunity. It was it was kind of a brand new story in the marketplace. Nobody was doing it was teaching anything like this before. Um, it was it the teaching copy, research or was it someone actually have doing research it, for you? So. No, this was teaching somebody how to become a, an internet researcher, Got it. and um, and teaching both the process of research, which is a fairly simple process. I mean, if you're really smart with Google, that that part of it, some of it's not going to feel very new. Um, but but the um, the business side of it is also what we taught, and um, you know those opportunities there, and and so. Um, but I think I think that really the most compelling thing was um, how to make fifty dollars an hour or more uh, sitting at home surfing the web, um, you know. Or I th I think I think the headline was um, collect up to fifty dollars an hour backdoor copywriting income without writing a single word. And you know I I know we plan on talking about headlines a little bit here, but. Yes. Um, collect and and um, and and without are two very good words in a headline, mm -hmm. um, and and this was a good lesson in that 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 uh, there that there was an opportunity to be part of this this writer's life and to um, enjoy some of the success of of yeah. the copywriting industry without having to write. Yeah. Um, and and so there was definitely a uniqueness to the opportunity and and a feeling of geez like i never knew that there are people who actually um 
can sit there and surf the web and get paid for it because they're helping out these publishers and writers yeah. find source information. Yeah. Um, we'll talk yeah, about and, before the writer's life for you too, because there's an interesting, some interesting stories there for you. I mean, yeah. literally, where I could spend a whole session on just what we talked about in the intro. I think so. I'm going to ask yeah. one more question with the intro, and we'll get into some of the big lessons, and mistakes. But the Taguchi testing handbook. What's yeah. one thing someone needs to know from the Taguchi testing handbook? Is Taguchi come from somewhere, or where is that that term? Um, yeah, it, it actually comes from a, a uh, Japanese manufacturing expert okay. who figured out this way to statistically test um, a whole bunch of different variables at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, that It's like the equivalent of running, I don't know, uh, 4,000 or more tests when really you only have to run nine or 16 things against each other. Mm -hmm. um, what you need to know about Taguchi is that it's probably too complex. And this is just being honest. Right, you know, right. it's it's probably too complex. It's advanced. World's it's, most advanced. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it is. And um, what we found, and I've talked to Bob about this, is that people that are really serious about testing and that drive a lot of traffic can get a lot of value out of this. Mm -hmm. um, but for most people, the most valuable chapter in the book, and frankly, it's worth every penny, is um, there's a chapter on how to test and how to design test inputs. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a saying, there's actually a saying from Glenn, Glenn Livingston, who's a marketing expert, testing expert, um, that, that most people think that they're testing like you know, six different headlines or six different ads or whatever, when really they're testing six different versions of the same ad. Mm -hmm. And what this, um, what this chapter laid out within that book was um, basically the principle that the broader difference between what you're testing is, the broader the difference will be in the results that you get. Mm -hmm. And that means that you're going to have one big winner and one, um, you know, not as big of a winner or loser. Um, but but the idea is that you want to spread what you're testing so much that you that you force a difference in results. And if one of them fails, that's okay. Or if five out of six fail, that's okay. If you find the one that's a that's a really big winner, and and you're not going to figure that out by testing, you know, um, uh, title caps versus uh, sentence case yeah. or um, so. What would be an example? What would be an example where of two separate headlines that would be one? would be much broader that you may get a different response from. Yeah. Well, off the top of my head this the, it's it's a little bit difficult to do. Yeah. But let me let me just think about the Cuz I remember the, Brian when I talked to him did talk about this and yeah. he mentioned well, some example which I can't remember. What they would do in particular what 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 Boardroom would do is they would hire two or three of the top copywriters at at you know 15 20 25,000 or more a pop and um test have each of them develop their own packages for the same product completely independently and test them against each other, mm -hmm. um, which is which is exactly what I'm talking about here. Taken to you know the extreme when you have a budget like they they did for for winners. I mean they they would know that um, just one of those being a big winner would more than make up for that investment. Mm -hmm. um, and my 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 reference to the headline or 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 to making a specific headline um, might be around this titans of direct response. So um, the current headline that I think is very good that actually I have to credit David Deutsch for, for a lot of it, but it's, it's just announcing the titans of direct response and it, you know, talks about the event. And, and so it is, it is a big announcement for this event. Um, what you could do, and this would really only require changing like the first page or two a copy is you could, um, you could write a brand new intro that's that's much more around the story of the event or um, something like that with an appropriate headline. So it just feels very different uh, when you load up the page. Um, the idea is that if you can't tell, if you don't see drastic differences in the first second or so um, of loading a page, you're not going to see drastic differences in the test results or, you know, an envelope that you pull out of the mailbox or whatever media you're going through. Um, so, that, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's the idea. I, I wouldn't necessarily think in terms of testing headlines for the most part, although I have run headline tests, you know, as recently as within the last couple of months. Right. Um, but I'd like to think about testing broad differences. Yes. And we'll get into that too. But so tell me, Roy, one of the biggest lessons you've learned. 
Um, well, this is going to sound like I'm pitching the, the Titans event even more, but I'm, I'm going to step back from that. It's, it's really learned from the masters. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been fortunate throughout my career when I worked with AWAI, um, I worked directly with Michael Masterson, Mark Ford, um, I worked with, with Katie Yackel, who's an excellent, excellent marketer in, in her own right um, and one of the founders of AWAI. Mm -hmm. uh, when I worked with K Casey Research, a lot of folks won't recognize the name, but I worked with David Galland, who's a uh, multi-billion dollar copywriter who has partnerships in, or who has had partnerships through his copywriting in lots of just monster um, businesses. Uh, around finances and financial uh, investing, that sort of stuff. Um, it, any chance I get to learn from somebody who's just absolutely brilliant, you know, a few minutes sitting down, I, I got to interview Bill Bonner one time, and just a few minutes sitting down with him, he's a co-founder of a um, of a nine-figure direct marketing publishing company. Um, and and just learning from from what little bit I can from from everybody who's who's uh, come before me allows me to stand on the shoulders of masters and and get ahead a lot quicker. So, who would you consider your top two mentors through your career? Oh, geez, um, I I really actually have to go back to to um, for number one, I have to go back to a guy who got me started mm -hmm. in in all of this, and it was. Uh, you you wouldn't know him. Uh, his name is Jeff Short, and he was um, my boss at my first and only marketing job, and a uh, very sharp, experienced direct marketer and salesperson. Um, and he just taught me so much about marketing, working directly under him, talking to him every day. You know, we would we would riff for thirty minutes or an hour just in the office in between things, and um, learned a lot that way. Um, I don't know. I, and just because of the personal connection and, and long relationship there, I, I count him as number one. I don't even know where to go for number two because there are so many people that yeah. qualify. You mentioned um, Mark Ford. What's a good piece of advice he's given you? Um, well, the one of the best pieces of advice wasn't necessarily what he gave me it was it was he he kind of riffed on on um subheads and bullet points for that researcher promo and just just seeing the simplicity of his of his writing you know get this enjoy this uh you get away from from this bad thing um and and just seeing the lightness of his writing and and later i mean he that lesson has come out through his speeches of um he always wants writing to be at you know using fleisch kincaid which is a readability score he always wants writing to be at uh 7.5 grade level or below mm -hmm. which is you know basically somebody who's in the middle of their seventh grade year junior high, um yeah. yeah they they can read it uh very easily and even if you're talking about a complex topic or speaking to sophisticated investors as as many of the businesses he's involved with do um you know he he still wants it to be 7.5 keep it simple yeah and and actually there's there's some beauty in that simplicity i mean i think about einstein equals mc squared i yes. mean it it's one of the most simple equations in 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 math and science yet it's considered to be one of the most brilliant um so just because it's simple doesn't mean it's it's stupid or right whatever um so yeah that's a yeah. that's a huge lesson yeah so Roy what about a big mistake uh my biggest mistake around uh so I do a lot of copywriting and marketing consulting and my biggest mistake um throughout that career is something I've recognized now um you know coming up on on a decade in the business is really not knowing myself and how I like to work mm -hmm. um as part of this Titans the direct response thing, I, I worked with David Deutsch. He did some critiques of my copy, and he was asking me for feedback on his critiques because I also got uh, feedback on the copy from Dan Kennedy and from Gary Bensvenga. And uh, he wanted to know what was different, how his was helpful or not helpful compared to theirs. Mm -hmm. And so we just it just started this conversation around like, the one thing that I'm most concerned about when I'm working with people and that will totally screw up a relationship because of my own ego stuff is um, if you want 
if I'm working for you and you want to make me a better copywriter, like the relationship is going to fall apart. If you want to help me get great copy out the door, we will have a lot of success together mm -hmm. um, because I, I really value getting great copy out the door, learning from experience of putting things in the market, seeing how people respond. Um, but if we're going to, you know, spend eight months on a project, it's um, just with the idea that, oh, I'm a really good copywriter and, and with with your help, I can be an even better one. I just fail under those circumstances. And, and um, my worst client relationships have come out of that. And it took me a couple, you know, kind of screw ups to, to figure that out. Um, but it is what it is. Um, and now that I've recognized it, I think, I think, um, learning from that mistake and no matter what mistake you make, you know, uh, um, uh, that's the best way to, uh, move forward and become better. You don't strike me with some of someone who has a big ego though. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I, I do, I, I do. Um, I believe actually a big ego is a healthy thing but I believe that you have to be able to also step outside of your ego. And um, so when I started talking about my big ego, it's also me stepping outside of my ego. But, yeah. but to be successful in this business, you have to have a, a very strong sense of self. And I, I studied psychology for, for years in college. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, a self-actualized person has a very big and confident ego mm -hmm. it's just that the, it's not the type of ego that's running over people usually it's a small ego actually mm -hmm. um, that most people think of as a big ego because it's somebody who is so um, insecure and feels so insignificant that mm -hmm. they have to run over other people yeah. um, somebody with a big healthy ego um, you know doesn't have to doesn't have to fight that fight and so mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I do I do certainly have a big ego um, and an easily bruised ego in some situations, yeah. but um, yeah. <laughs> so, what is some good advice I gave you with getting good copy out the door? David and Dan Kennedy and Gary Benzavinga, what did they tell you? Well, um, it it it's actually not. Uh, what what all of them did and and part of it was was kind of because the nature of that relationship is they were just asked to provide feedback right. um so provide feedback on on how to make great copy better uh or you know good copy great or whatever um and so so each of them provided specific feedback they they didn't provide specific recommendations on getting great copy out the door mm -hmm. they just focused on the copy and okay how can we improve this right. um when when you start to focus on the copywriter, there becomes this this whole dance of egos thing. Um, you know, when it's about let me show you how to be a better copywriter versus let's make this copy the best it can be, get it out there, test it. Right. Um, you know, it's it's two completely different um, approaches, and I find that for me, uh, it's getting great copy out the door. Uh, all I want to hear is okay, how can we make this better, and right. how can we do that fast. Um, and all three of them actually did that in this particular yeah. instance. So, I mean, what did they tell you? Because we only see the end yeah. version, right? We see yeah. the polished. You spending hours. You've spent hours weeks. and hours and hours, yeah. months, weeks, you know, doing <laughs> this. And we that's what we see, but we don't see all the tweaking along the way. So I'm wondering what were a yeah. few things that they pointed you Are, at, and what are some of the things you ended up tweaking? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so. Um, each of them had, had kind of a different role in the process. Mm -hmm. Um, David was, was with me at multiple touch points throughout. And so like in the early brainstorming phase, we kind of went back and forth and said, okay, what does this have to say? And he even threw out a headline idea that, that, um, the headline is probably 75% his, um, which, you know, one of my biggest successes in, in copywriting has, has come from recognizing when other people throw good headline ideas at me and just using them and not trying to mess with them too much. Right. Um, I, I personally think that I need to improve my, my headline writing ability so that I can take credit for more of my headlines. <laughs> but in the meantime, you know, I'll, I'll borrow other people's if, if they want to provide them. Um, and, and then he provided a lot of good insight around just kind of voice like you um just be careful 
he saw very, very, very early drafts of things that weren't even the main sales letter. But he said, this you know, is what I like ca- to hear. This is what I like to hear because yeah. that's what most people are starting with. You know? Yeah. Be be careful about not about um beca- about coming across as too much of a salesperson. Um, and this is something that I've heard. Any copywriter that I've ever met who has multiple billions of dollars in sales to their name um, doesn't tries to not sound like a salesperson, tries not to use all of the, you know, maybe Dan Kennedy's the exception, and I haven't heard his, his total. I know that he has some very successful promotions, um, you know, tens of millions of dollars. Um, but but um, the more you can sound like a friend writing to a friend in the, you know, barstool talk, and it sounds, it, it sounds like such a simple lesson, um, but the more you can strip away this, like, I'm a copywriter and I have to write sales copy, and the more you can just talk to somebody, sure, you format it like sales copy and use some of the sales copy tricks in, in retrospect to come back and, and, and draw people's attention to important items. But um, the more that the, the core narrative sounds like um, just a very friendly conversation, um, the better it'll, it'll do. And that's, that's what David really focused on very early in the process. Um, Dan saw the copy when it was 90% of the way there because it was going to, excuse me, going to his list and, um, he, he was going to have to, you know, at least okay it, but he provided 19 line item feedback, uh, items that were very, very much Dan, Dan style. I mean, all, none of it was praise. None of it was, was, was trashing it. You wanted to include the term no BS or? No, I'm, I just, think, I'm just joking. I, well, no, I think I think I might have been. <laughs> um, no, but but um, his, his biggest changes were all around his own personal positioning, which he's a master at. So, like in in the little blurb at the top of the page, and if people want to actually see this, I'll throw this this URL yeah, out right now. It's Titans 2014.net. We'll take you to the page, and we'll Titan, link it up too. Yeah, Titans 2014.net. Um, but he wanted to make sure that. In the little blurb at the very top of the page under his picture, um, that it said that he charged seventy thousand dollars and up for copywriting projects. I mean, that was one of his edits. Um, later on, I had this thing where I riffed on like all his successes, like his his. He, I mean, he has like three three different um, business categories that he operates in, and he races horses. Um, and he's like at the horse track daily, training his horses and stuff. Um, and and rather than my my short riff on that, he wanted a longer riff that added even more details, so that you know if there's an ideal client reading, um, they see all these different things that he can do, and it's very much personal pos- positioning stuff. And also, Dan is kind of a master of copy cosmetics, and okay, put this block of copy in a mm-hmm. different font that you don't use anywhere else in the sales letter. We had a thing that that actually came out of a fax from him to Brian. Um, and so he wanted that in kind of like a typewriter font, uh, something different that really stood out on the page as being different and drawing your eye. Mm-hmm. And and that's something Dan does a lot is draw people's eyes into the copy with all these different cosmetic changes. And so a lot of the stuff that he provided feedback on was that. Mm-hmm. And a, a few small positioning things that I think were very big. Um, but but that's the type of feedback he gave. And then Gary Bensavenga in particular he got the copy very late in the game because the copy was basically written when he agreed to do his presentation. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote a block about him and his choice to do it and his background and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, his main change, uh, he added a testimonial. He's known for proof element marketing. So uh, he, added, he added a great testimonial from Doug Deanna. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something like, you know, somebody's considered a good copywriter if they, if they win one out of four tests. Somebody's considered a great copywriter if they win uh, two out of four tests. And it, when somebody wins seven out of eight tests that, they're, that their uh, copy is, is entered into, you call them Gary Bensavenga. And, <laughs> Um, and so it's this, you know, it's this great, it's this great quote from Doug Deanna. Um, but then Gary, like all that I had was like a secondhand recount of the initial conversation where Gary said, Hey, Brian, you know, I wouldn't do this for anybody else. But, um, this, this is actually a tribute event for Marty Edelston, yeah. who's the founder of boardroom, but, but for, for Marty who passed away, um, I'll, I'll, you know, break my vow of silence and, and do a presentation. I, I would love to, I'd love to participate. And um, 
so I, I had like three bullet points that were based on just kind of a vague, like what I thought Gary might talk about. And he came back with just this list of amazing bullets, which um, uh, the sales letters worth reading for his brand new copy alone, mm -hmm. um, much less anything I wrote. Um, but, um, but yeah, that, I mean, that was his primary feedback and, and he, he's, he, he, he also had very high praise for the letter, which, you know, is one of those, uh, things that will be a, a, you know, a notch, uh, right. a big for notch, me for life. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. What um, was something that he wrote back at, like you said, these bullets that were amazing. What was one that stuck out to you when you read it? You're like, wow, that is, that is truly amazing. Let me, I'm going to pop open this, um, and scroll down really quick yeah. because I, I'm just going to, I'm, I, I got lessons out of at least one of them, yeah. at least a couple of them, just on um, bullet writing. Um, I mean, he has he has so he's planning his 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 topic as he's writing. He's planning a speech as he's writing these bullets, and so he's he says, you know, the eight habits of super successful marketers, copywriters, and entrepreneurs, the twelve most powerful secrets of high probability marketing. Um, and um, he's he's um, you know just watching how the rhythm of this eight habits twelve most powerful secrets um, those those things just as you read through it it um, it's a lesson in bullet writing to me because you know for example he has a, a medium length bullet a short bullet a shorter bullet and then a long bullet another long bullet a short bullet um, and and um, there's kind of an ebb and flow to it. But but um, this one jumped out at me because with the longer bullets, he takes them like so. So um, there, there's kind of the one two punch, right, that, that, that some copywriters teach in terms of writing bullets. Well, um, and then and then there's there's that book that came out recently, like Jab, Jab, Left Hook or, or uh, Jab, 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 Right Hook. Right hook or, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and he like does all that. And then, you know, he throws in a a kick for good measure. Um, so how to reverse engineer monster breakthroughs. Okay, that already sounds good. And this is all, all the same bullet. Discover how much easier it is to create big winners when you start by focusing on the end result you want and then work backwards to create it. So we've already got kind of the one, two, almost three. And then, um, you know, and then the, the knockout kick, he says, this is Gary's all-time favorite secret for hitting marketing home runs. And so to just see his process of like drawing out these bullets and drawing out, um, okay, yet another reason you want to be listening for this, yet another reason you're going to want to be taking notes. Um, and, and everything is also kind of um, over the top. Um, which I actually struggle a lot with in my copywriting because I want to maintain some sense of, of candor and not be um, just a straight hype copywriter. For it to seem real. Yeah. yeah. But but he has this kind of natural like, um, you know, how you can dream bigger and achieve more in your life than you ever imagined possible. You know, that uh, he uses words like easiest a lot, uh, simple secrets. Um, and and because everything else around it is so um, has 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 such a high level of detail, it really does. Um, it 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 never comes across as too much. It's just this very very um, light and easy to and and I think the rhythm helps and all that. But it's it's just this light and easy to agree with and easy to get excited about um, set of claims. Um, that 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 is that are just wonderful um and and you know his his use of imagery here i mean he has the simple nine part pre-flight checklist so so you already are thinking okay what's a pre-flight checklist it's what a, a pilot uses every time they take off right it will tell you whether a piece of copy is strong or weak before you run it instantly reveals to expert or novice alike where a copy falls short and where you must strengthen it mm -hmm. i mean these things are makes you are, think i need that checklist yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm 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 looking at that like, oh god, I can't wait till September. Anything I write between now and <laughs> September, <laughs> I'm 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 already regretting that I don't have that checklist. Um, so so yeah. Um, I guess I don't know exactly. I, I've already forgotten exactly what the question. No, that is, was but, it. Was just going through yeah. some of those bullet points and what you found amazing with it, and. 
we'll go through some of the you know the early days for you too but I want to hear too um, you know the audience is thinking what you know we've already given a, you've already given them a lot of um, interesting detailed things they can immediately apply what's one thing they can do to get some a quick win to get results right now all right so when I'm when I think quick win and you know I'm I'm a copywriter and most people think of me as a copywriter and I've been very successful as a copywriter but um, my my quickest wins are always stepping back and taking a look at strategy and that's a really that's really the x factor of of almost all great great um copywriters and consultants is being a strategist first and foremost yeah. and okay i can write this the copy too yeah. um but very 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 simply this is an innovation that's really being um honed and perfected right now online um when somebody makes is, well let me rewind to the direct mail days for for just a moment. Yeah. Um, there, when you rented lists, there was a compiled list that just these people had something in common. There was a response list. There was a response list based on on um, products, you know, uh, transaction size. There were multi buyers lists, um, and and um, the further you went up that spectrum of like people actually taking action based on an offer similar to what you what you have to sell them the more valuable that list was and the more uh they were more expensive to rent but they're also a much higher probability of of having a success converting yeah. well yeah um so so online um you have no better target market than somebody who has literally just pressed order now you know they've they have just converted on your website and um i still talk to these these you know, big, well-established direct response publishers. Um, I have yet another one that I that I just just talked to, just started talking to last week, who um, who haven't quite figured out that you don't need to let somebody rest for three weeks before you uh, go market to them again. That literally, um, somebody that bought a forty nine pro forty nine dollar newsletter subscription from you today is actually. Um, probably your most likely person to buy a four hundred ninety nine dollar trading service from you today, and you can literally um, show them the forty nine dollar offer. You can then you can show them a four hundred ninety nine dollar offer, and then you can show them a four thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollar offer for a lifetime subscription. And a small percentage is gonna is gonna step each step, um, but these these sales funnels that are that are two three four um, sales deep. Are are um, are really the secret right now because the secret to to growing your business is not um, and actually I've been thinking about this a lot because I I intend to write a blog post on it very soon but the secret to growing your business fast isn't spending as little as possible to get as many new customers I mean everybody wants to drive down their cost of customer acquisition but if you really want to like blow something up there's there's ad networks that you see all over the internet with all these all these um, ads at the bottom of USA Today articles and everything else to really blowing blowing up is being able to spend more than everybody else who's competing for that space um, to to get your customers and so if somebody if if you're able to get customers at at, at forty nine dollars is your break even but you know that um, you're gonna make let's say four hundred ninety nine dollars on average within the first thirty days well um, somebody that's only putting one offer in front of those people mm -hmm. and who is also breaking breaking even at forty nine but doesn't have a way to get four hundred ninety nine in the first thirty days. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're you're going to be able to run run over your competition. And really, the secret is these these sales funnels and stepping people up. Um, I mean, I have a client that I wrote something for in October, who's actually spent the last six months um, retooling his business um, so that he can do this kind of stepped up offer. And I can't share specific numbers, but he's basically saying that it's completely changing his business. And this is somebody who's really sharp, really successful already. Um, but but implementing these sales funnels with good copy all the way through and really offers that make sense as you step somebody up. I mean, it's it's just, um, it, it can completely transform a business. And um, it's, plus as a copywriter or consultant, um, all of a sudden I'm writing three um, promotions and getting royalties on three right. promotions instead of one. Um, so, you know, there's that benefit too. So it's, you know, giving them the sales funnel advice 
in addition to actually building out what that copy looks like for each of the funnels. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and 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 really understanding that you know somebody that buys, um, I, well let's 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 stick with investing products. Uh, maybe somebody buys a a tech newsletter. Um, they a tech investing newsletter. Well, your forty nine dollar one might be you know big tech companies. Your 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 four hundred ninety nine dollar one might be um, small tech companies, um, and. And then your four thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollar service may include all of your investing advice um, together, um, but really being able to 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 step somebody up in a logical fashion and providing mm -hmm. that advice is really valuable to clients because I think a lot of people hear this and then they don't think through the customer experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they'll, you know, do an irrelevant offer for offer number two and then just doesn't know, convert. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, talking about this, stepping through that process, you know, when they check, how do you think it works? And I'm sure it will vary from industry, but would you send that to them in an email or would you send that when they buy it, they go to a separate page with the, the information? How would, how would, what have you seen yeah. work I get with the structure of it? My preferred way to structure it is, um, is to, uh, land somebody on a page, uh, immediately after their purchase that basically says thank you for your for your for your order um, it's processing right now and you'll receive confirmation shortly including say login details if there's something that they're getting online um, but but while your order is processing I wanted to let you know about this additional item that I think will be of interest and then it's I mean the thank you page is also the sales letter for the next level up mm. um, and and um, the best ones are ones where there are where they continue to receive follow up. So you know it you you can create this in in a much more complex and sophisticated manner. But okay, if I got through step one but never converted on step two, well, in addition to being fulfilled on step one and fulfillment and great customer experience should should be number one. Um, but but um, following up with additional emails driving me back into step number two, or if I converted on step number two, driving me back into step number three, right. um, you know that's really the the ideal system. Um, but it but it really starts with not even you know waiting for them to go click an email. It it really starts with okay, you know here's your uh, here's the next step. Right. Um, and and if somebody, I mean, at that point they're so excited about the product that they just purchased. Um, or else they wouldn't have purchased it. Right. That it just makes sense that they're they're already in the right mindset. And and another benefit to that is oftentimes, um, depending on how a website is programmed or the shopping cart software works or whatever, it can literally be a one click upsell. So mm -hmm. you know you've already given us permission to charge your card uh, for that first product. Um, if you're interested in this next product, all you have to do is say yes. Yeah. Well, you also mentioned um, we were talking earlier, and you wrote uh, there's some big roadblocks. Personally and professionally, yeah. Yeah. What's what's one of those big roadblocks, and and how has it affected you? Because I think yeah. this is a common. A lot of people experience this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, this, I mean, this pulls me out of the out of the marketing world. But yeah. um, I, as an adult, I figured out that I have ADHD, and yeah. it's um, actually the inattentive subtype. So I'm not I'm not the guy that bounces off the walls all the time, but my thoughts are bouncing off yeah. off you know, the inside of my skull all the time. Um, so I'm, I'm really distractible. And um, I wasn't diagnosed as a kid because, you know, I didn't look like ADHD. Um, but, but Yeah, you picture the, someone kind of bouncing all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but but um, the, the fascinating, like, I had this, I had this experience um, as a kid where when I was interested and excited about a class, I would do very well. Um, but when I was not excited about a class, I would fail, and I wouldn't do my homework, and I wouldn't, you know, um, and it was it was it was not capability that was causing me to fail or succeed, which you know caused my parents to go gray and pull their hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's that. um, but it happened starting in junior high all the way through college when I finally just kind of got my act together because I was paying extra tuition for every class I failed. Um, but um, but it was. Uh, 
um, this, 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 this really negative experience and I didn't know what it was. And I learned later as I got diagnosed that it, that it was actually, um, I'm diagnosable as ADHD inattentive. Um, and I've tried medicine, but I, I don't, um, really like being on medication all day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I recognize that some people need it. I'm not, but my personal experience, it doesn't work for me. Um, so what works for you? Um, deadlines. Um, because deadlines kind of force an excitement about a project. Mm -hmm. Um, so giving myself deadlines, um, I've managed to actually stay on top of a daily marketing email for, for two months so far. And it really is the the deadline of a daily email. People Um, are expecting it. Yeah. 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 And I have, I have a very engaged readership so far. So, um, staying busy, uh, keeping my calendar full allows me to be less distracted. Um, I, there's a trick that I learned from Gene Schwartz, um, not personally, but through a recording. Right. Um, and and he had a kitchen timer that he would take with him everywhere he went and whenever he needed to sit down and write. And he even did it for his speeches. He would set a timer for 33 minutes and 33 seconds and press go. And he was allowed to do anything having to do with his task during that 33 minutes and 33 seconds, including not doing that task, you know, just sitting there and staring at a blank page. Um, but he could not get up. He could not do anything else mm-hmm. um, during while that timer was going on. And so I have I have like five or six timers floating around our house here, and I have a home office. So um, that um, they're well worth it because um, they, they're it's a very effective way to stay focused. Um, music without lyrics, I it it helps a lot. Um, I have some favorite. Uh, f- like uh, Spanish style guitarists and some electronic music and uh, classical music, uh, rocking it with Rachmaninoff, uh, <laughs> um, and and uh, just also just using systems. Like if I know that I have to write, um, if I have a campaign and I know it has a main sales letter and it has uh, five lift note emails and uh, eight space ads and all this stuff like having all of that laid out in front of me before I start writing allows me to to just stay on track a lot easier Mm -hmm. um being a little bit planful about that yeah I want to get to you know when you talk about staying busy and your schedule's full um and you used to have a different schedule before you were a copywriter what were what was your early career days like before copy before copywriting yeah so um before Completely before I discovered copywriting, I had a uh, a BA in psychology and a minor in English. And what that qualified me for, because in psychology, if you don't get like a MA and yeah. probably a PhD, yeah. really. My wife's a um, psychologist, so yes. I, yeah, well, yeah. mine too. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. A PsyD, um, PhD? PhD. Okay. Yeah. Um, she has a private practice and she's done some work with the university here too. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um so, so if you don't get like this ID or PhD or whatever, um, you really don't have a career <laughs> opportunity in psychology. So I was working in the uh, call center at our local gas company, gas and electric company. Um, and what that meant was when you went all, win- all winter without paying your gas bill and we kept it on because the law said we have to keep it on. Well, come the first warm day in March or April, when we were allowed by law to turn off your gas for non-payment, Uh, I was the person that you called and screamed at and said it was my fault that you didn't pay your bill and so we shut off your gas. Sounds like a wonderful job. (laughs) And that was was my first 40-hour-a-week full-time job, which is a completely miserable place. Uh, (laughs) um, And I I really don't know how people – I mean, there were people there that were kind of lifers, and I really don't know how they – it wasn't for me. Um, But – what it did, because I worked like noon to 9 p.m. shift, and after about 6 or 7 p.m., you don't get a lot of calls, uh, it gave me a lot of reading time. And so I, having a little bit of background, I, I was a self-published poet in college, hmm. and um, which, you know, my grandma bought like 10 copies of my book. And, and yes, uh, I, yeah. I sold 10 copies. Like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but... Um, so I had kind of a writing background, and so I read a book called The Well-Fed Writer by Peter Bowerman, um, which talks about commercial freelance writing, mm-hmm. um, and I discovered the copywriter's handbook, and from there it was kind of a black hole that, you know, I knew that this was the right thing for me, and I just dove into direct response. I I, I, I wasn't a fan of, like, content writing or Peter 
Peter Bowerman, uh, the well-fed writer guy, he does like annual reports and white papers and stuff. And that just wasn't for me, but I love kind of the thrill of direct response. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so, um, I just dove into that and, how did you get um, your first client then? Well, I actually didn't get my first client. We were moving across the country for my wife's PhD program. Mm -hmm. And, um, I started looking for marketing jobs instead of something that like leveraged my background and cut utility customer service because they didn't at. want to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically I said, I have, I, I did have some sales background, um, but I said, I have, I have no marketing experience. You have, you know, nothing on my resume says that I should be, be qualified for this job. Um, but I'll tell you that I'll work harder and learn more on the job and ultimately be more successful than anybody who does have all the experience on their resume. Um, and I applied to a uh, an IT training company that that published IT training videos on the internet, and um, and we they actually hired a guy with a lot more experience. He lasted two weeks, and then they brought me in. Um, and then over the course of the next four or five years, I worked with him initially in marketing, and I kind of took over the marketing department within a couple months. Oh. And um, then eventually I moved to sales because I wanted a commission, and marketing in that company didn't provide a commission or royalties or anything like that. And uh, we more than doubled the business. We put them on Inc. Magazine's list of the fastest growing companies in America, um, provided a huge liquidity event for the, the owner um, when we got an investment from a business development company. Um, just had tons of success there. Really learned the ins and outs of working in a marketing department, uh, selling things online. We did some direct mail. We did some space advertising. Um, and then I went on from there and kind of all along the way. I mean, I started the job in 2005. In 2006 or seven. I got my first freelance copywriting client. I was working, you know, six to seven in the morning I was writing for for a freelance client and then I'd get ready for work and mm -hmm. head off to work um and and I freelance from 2007 ish until 2000 February 2010 um uh, when I just said all right time to go full-time um and I never really looked back so was that a tough decision at the time or was it a no-brainer how did you because I find when people yeah. go kind of transition to that it's yeah. somewhat uneasy. Uh, I had known actually since before I got the full-time marketing job that that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And actually I was kind of mad at myself that I hadn't done it already, but I was so comfortable in this other job. I mean, we had like sushi every Tuesday and something right. else how do you, for how do lunch you, on Friday. Right. And exactly. I was paid well. I had a salary, all that stuff. There was no uncertainty. Right. But um, I, I, um, I just knew that it was time to do it. Mm -hmm. And... I worked very hard, like I set a date and I worked very hard to build up a, a, a collection of projects, um, to, to be doing. And, um, so it was both a hard transition and an easy one. It was, it was hard in the sense that I should have done it like years before that. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was also easy because I had so much built up. Uh, also we were moving across the country six months later, five months later, uh, for, you know, more, psych grad school stuff um, I've, I've gone through that too so i know that yeah. goes yeah <laughs> um and and so so um it it was also a looming deadline like i couldn't work full-time right. in the office anymore like so you're you're leaving you can't yeah. you can't work here anymore yeah um so it was also kind of an easy transition so roy what have been some of the most successful campaigns and why they were effective um, well, one of my favorite ones that's, that was kind of off the wall, but, uh, repeatable is, uh, for, uh, so you're familiar with Jeff Walker product launch formula. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're probably, you may be familiar with Clayton Makepeace and the events that he's done at Weiss. Um, well, um, I, and I guess people, people have done like webinar related sales, sales promotions for a long time. But but Clayton was really the first guy doing it in uh, the financial publishing space, and he was being very successful at Weiss, but nobody had really kind of cracked the nut on that. Um, but I watched what he was doing, and I was a student of, of product launch formula and, and trying to figure all this stuff out. Um, and I reverse engineered it and, like, drew out on my computer, like, an entire campaign map of, okay, we need to send out 
uh, these three to five emails to invite people to join the event that needs to take them to an opt-in page. It needs to talk nothing about making the sale. Uh, once e everything leading up to the event itself needs to be talking about attending the event, talking nothing about the products or making a sale. Um, and then, and then here's how we structure follow up after the event. This is what the sales pitch looks like. This is the offer that we're going to do. And so I, I created this, this, um, campaign map, um, first for Casey research. And then later we, I did it at Molden economics. Um, the companies are connected. So, um, uh, but, um, it was a, a very high production webinar. They rented studio space and brought in these top financial experts and economists and um, did kind of these interview roundtable discussions. It's huge. Um, yeah. It's really yeah. high quality. Um, and, and, um, and so we worked, we worked, we, 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 um, we did these events and they were enormously successful. Um, the, they got tens of thousands of new leads. Uh, we got people to do joint venture promotions that wouldn't normally do joint venture promotions um, because the event was such a high caliber. Uh, we got hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales in weeks following the events. Uh, they, they exceeded expectations um, quite a bit. And, um, and it's funny because Clayton had been doing this for such a long time, but nobody else had done it. Um, and then once once I created this model, this event campaign, all these other financial publishers started copying it, um, and and I still see them doing it today. And it's not like I'm the originator of this. I I really didn't do anything new. I I, I even sat down with Clayton uh, when I was doing my second or third one of these events, and 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 I asked him, okay, what can I do to make it better? And he provided um, an idea about a step down offer after you've after the first deadline has passed, and. Um, uh, you know, uh, so I'm basically ripping off Clayton, which has been one of the most profitable things I've done in my career <laughs> um, uh, in multiple ways. I mean, I use his copy outline, uh, things like that. Um, but um, I was really proud of these campaigns because um, I felt like that they were a much broader use of my talent than just writing copy. Yeah. Um, they haven't been my most profitable copy um, but, but they were very, very successful campaigns and to see them used over and over again is really cool. Yes. Uh, yeah. Once again, um, setting up that whole kind of funnel of yeah. what people use. Yeah. So how does um, it look? Are they, I mean, this is a recorded and you put it on, are people watching it live or how does it, what are the, some of the technical stuff of how do they use it? Yeah. Well, we treated it like live and promoting the event. Um, if people asked, we told them that it was being pre-recorded and then broadcast right. live. Right. Um, you know, and so they re it was recorded about three days before broadcast, and that gave the video team enough time to edit and right. throw in, you know, backgrounds and things like that. Um, I mean, that that technical stuff. The biggest technical hurdle um, has always been uh, making sure that you can support like tens of thousands of people landing on the same web page at the same time. Yeah. So for example, you might think, okay, we, we have this, uh, we have a very good video streaming service that we have, you know, their video feed embedded in our site. But we didn't think about the fact that in like two minutes leading up to the event, all of a sudden 20,000 people are going to be hitting our servers to load the page that contains the video stream. Right. And um, the page has got to be up for them to load it. Yeah. 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 Um, and so you can, you can, you can deal with a lot of technical problems there, but I'm not the expert. I mean, I'm kind of technical, but I'm not the expert on making right. sure that stuff is, is good. Yeah, um, I'm just curious about the funnel. Like you have the pre-recorded yeah. you know, video and that, that obviously they kind of opt into some kind of offer yeah. and then. Well, yeah, we, we treat it like an event and you're always opting in for the event. You're not opting in for sales, anything you're, you're opting in for this content event. Right. And, um, and then it's, Everything leading up to the event and towards the very end when they start to mention that there will be an offer coming um, is just pure content and, and selling the content, uh, selling uh, its free content, but selling the free content um, to get people to, to watch it live. Uh, because when people actually show up live, they're more committed and you're, you just get much better conversions from people that show up for the live broadcast than for people that didn't. Um, and, you know, we got a couple of complaints out of, you know, tens of thousands of people that said, 
well, we could tell this wasn't live. Um, but ultimately, the, the campaign the was a success. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, they, they were just bugged, I guess, about setting aside time at work because um, it was during the work day. Um, but um, so, so after, immediately after the, the broadcast, it redirected people to the, to the sales page. And then there was a bunch of follow-up around the offer. Um, and we actually split out, okay, this person opted in and didn't watch the event. This person opted in and did watch the event. And this person got the original, this person's just a, a house name and, and, um, and got the original promotion, but never opted in. And we had um, separate follow-up after the event for those people. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that didn't watch, whether they opted in or not, they got things encouraging them to watch for the most part and didn't get offer related stuff. They got less communication. The people that opted in and watched got offer related follow up. So, um, yes. you know, they, they got like one link to the replay yes. and the follow up. But, Very customized. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, I go back to um, thinking about customer experience there that, um, that, the best copywriters and strategists spend um, a lot of time thinking about, okay, like what is, who is this customer? What's the conversation going on in their head? Um, and even something as simple as this, when you're splitting out your email list for people opting in for an event, um, did they attend? Did they not attend? Um, if they opted in, like, and how does that impact their relationship with us and how we need to communicate with them? Mm -hmm. Um, and and because because if I send an email to somebody that didn't opt in and didn't um, didn't watch the event, and I say because you attended the event, I wanted to give you the special offer, like it just falls flat. Incongruent, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so thinking from the customer side as much as possible is is really helpful in 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 yeah. doing a big complex com campaign like that. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's cool about those, just really quickly, you know, why were they so effective? Is yeah. is the appeal of anything that's event-based is the fact that it is an event um, and people like to be part of something big. You know, this is a huge event going on and people want to be there for it. Um, and it allows for the creation of anticipation and urgency. There's a, there's a built-in deadline. And as you go up to the deadline, you can increase the anticipation, the urgency. Um, and it also, I mean, one of the big things about doing sales or making special offers is if you don't have a good reason for the offer, and it can be as simple as like a 4th of July sale. You see that in retail all the time. Um, but if you don't have like a good reason why for a sale, uh, it will fall flat. Um, but the the event, if you say we're doing this as a special offer around this event for one week only, it just is a very simple um, but logical reason to make a special offer and to get people to respond uh, with with some sense of urgency, and and um, and I think that that's what makes those things so effective is is there's a lot of built-in deadlines and, and anticipation and excitement around them. Yeah. So Roy, that was a successful. What about one that didn't do so well, and why? Well, this is a this is a personal um, a personal thing. I I, I like actually... what you I like what you're about to say here because this <laughs> anyone can relate to this. I mean, yeah. So so I I have kind of built a reputation in the copywriting community and and um, I tried to launch my own kind of marketing and copywriting coaching program and I have access to like I own a LinkedIn group and I'm. I, it's it's a very different relationship than if somebody's on say like a house email list or something. But I own a LinkedIn group of of copywriters. It's the Claude C Hopkins group. So these are people who are really dedicated to direct response. But sure. I hadn't really built like an actual list of people who knew me, like me, trusted me. Um, and this was a high end coaching program. And it would have been a great coaching program, but but it really just fell flat on its face because I didn't have kind of a an audience built already. Um, and, and, um, and so it was, it was just a failure. It was, it was a great learning experience. Um, but I've, I've, I've thought about that a lot and I've actually turned around and like I mentioned for the last two months, I've been, I've been building an engaged audience. I, I've been writing a daily email, um, providing some of my best advice. And I, I mean, I've had people go so far as to say that these are as good as Gary Bensavinga's Bensavinga bullets. And I don't agree, <laughs> but, um, I appreciate the, the praise. 
Um, and it's a daily email on marketing, copywriting, um, you know, building a direct response business. And um, this is at breakthroughmarketingsecrets.com. Yeah, breakthroughmarketingsecrets.com. Yeah. And I've just spent a ton of time delivering um, value to that list. And and now that I've started talking about, I think I'm going to host a workshop here in November. Now that I've started talking about that, I have a lot of people that are very interested in in. Um, actually buying something that wouldn't be interested if I approached them cold or with less of a relationship mm -hmm. um, because I've been providing all of this value up front without asking for anything more than their email address. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, so, yeah, it's really, to me, it was a lesson. I, I work all the time with clients where I'm able to sell cheap products to cold audiences. I mean, it's kind of the, the height of direct marketing is people that can go out and sell a $49 newsletter or something like that um, to thousands of people. Um, but um, but for something like this, I need to have my list. I need to have my engaged audience. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, so, yeah, it, yeah. That, that's both a, what, what's failed and what I'm doing uh, to learn from it yeah. as a result of my learning. And I know we we're running low on time, so I want to hit a couple things because um, there's so much more I can ask you. But about the ways you craft a story, and you learned some lessons from Bill Bonner. Yeah, so I had I had a great opportunity to sit down with Bill. Um, he he presented at AWAI's boot camp a few years back. He's done it twice, and both have been great talks. Um, but he he like has no I mean a lot of people have a have another agenda for for presenting at marketing conferences he has no other agenda like he's there um his company makes hundreds of thousands of dollars a year um there is nothing that they can give him um or the audience can give him that um that will cause him to change his behavior. So he's just very honest. I mean, he said one of the one one of the best things is uh, one of the best things to do if you want to start copywriting is to put a bottle of whiskey in in the right desk drawer and put a revolver in the left desk drawer and then bleed out on the page. <laughs> um, but he also provided some really good copywriting tips. Among them, this 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 um, this this way that he crafts the story that I've tried to adopt as much as possible, and that is. Um, that he really sets aside all the copywriting techniques and tactics and whatever. And he, uh, and, and I got to, I got to interview him at that conference, I guess is where I was going with that. Um, and, and he told me this personally that he really just tries to put himself in the prospect's mind by like re reading the things that the prospects are reading and making sure that he's staying on top of the news and, mm -hmm. and in financial, I mean, you know what you have to do. You have to read yeah. the wall street journal and blogs and all that stuff. But, um, put himself in the prospect's mind and then as he's kind of going through all this stuff that's floating around out there in the market, finding a story that 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 interests him or that interests you or interests me, um, being in the prospect's mind already, uh, finding that story and then just telling it the most compelling way, like what details capture your interest and your attention and just telling the story. Um, and and it if it's built not out of like okay I want to shove this story down your throats but like geez this is really exciting to me and let me convey my excitement about this and what about it's making me excited mm -hmm. I think that that's really like um, that's really the best way um, that that I've developed so far I mean learning from drama and how to create drama and and stuff like that is helpful too but it all comes back to that. Mm -hmm. And right, so I want to hear about one of the proudest moments. And we were talking about it the first part of the interview. And yeah. I want to know, talk about how it came to be. You were the copywriter behind the titans of direct response and copywriting sales letter. Yeah, so I would spent, spent probably a couple of years like just developing a nice professional relationship with Brian Kurtz. Yeah. And having gone to that event last year featuring Perry Marshall, I mean, he for a couple of years, he's done these private closed door invitation only events that are really designed for his network of people to help them just become better at a currently relevant marketing skill. And um, and so I went to the one with Perry Marshall last year and then he and I had just stayed in touch. And when he pinged his list and said, hey, um, since you were at the at the event last year, I was wondering if you had any ideas for what how to make the next one even better. And I was like the first person to get back to him, and we spent some time on the phone, and we 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 really just stayed connected through his planning process for this event. 
Um, and actually right at about that same time, Marty passed away. And so he like, it really became important to him to make this great event. Yeah. And, um, it had been a relationship where I didn't have any real expectation. Um, and, um, yeah, you just wanted to help cause that's your passion. Yeah. That's what you like to do. And, and you wanted to contribute. Yeah. And he's a good guy and all that really just kind of motivated me to, to be part of it. Um, but, um, then uh, about a month ago, a little more than a month ago, um, he had sent a draft of the sales letter for the event over to David Deutsch. And it's like four pages and it's Brian prose, but it's also trying to be copy. And um, and David said, Brian, you know, if I'm going to if I need somebody to help me with uh, finding the best lists for my marketing and finding the right market for my marketing, I'm going to call you. Um, but you need to call a copywriter. <laughs> and and it was because of this relationship that I had with Brian that he turned around and said, you know what, Roy's the person. And he emailed me on a Sunday afternoon and said, can you talk tonight? And I said, well, not tonight because I got family stuff, but tomorrow morning. And, you know, Monday morning, I'm on the phone with him, and um, he said, what can you do with this? And I took, like, his I don't know, four, six, eight-page sales letter and now, if you include all the FAQ stuff at the bottom and all that, it's 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 going on fifty pages. Wow. Um. Of of, and and it it really started. From, it must be I, good because I read it and it didn't seem like fifty pages. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm 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 such like a, a a student of the industry and of all these people that it just felt very natural for me to be able to kind yeah. of riff on how exciting it is yeah. to have all these people. You're in talking on both ends as a excited person who's going to attend and also a co expert copywriter. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so it was actually, you know, it seems like, and even Gary Benzvenga said that, Oh, this should be, this was a hard project to be successful at because you're not only are you writing for other writers, you're writing, you know, about their bios and about them. And you know, that, that makes it quite difficult. Um, and the funny thing is like, I felt like it's one of the easiest projects I've written any time recently because I was just so excited about it, and it all just kind of came out of me. Um, and I used Brian's stories as a starting point, used some other boardroom stories that I knew. Um, but then it was just a matter of, like, isn't it amazing? This person's going to be there, and think of all the things that they're going to be able to do or, you know, to share, and mm -hmm. this person's going to be there. And, um, and, and um, yeah, so... so um, it was it was just one of those things. I, I mean, Brian in his latest weekly email called it a a masterpiece, mm -hmm. and, yeah, and I, I said that. Gary, Gary Benzvinga said told me it sings. So um, it's like and, Roger Ebert talking about <laughs> top films, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was yeah. um, it it's certainly been one of my proudest accomplishments. It's also so far shaping up to. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a very financially successful promo for Brian. And um, so, you know, that, that part's great too. Of course, putting on an event like this, I mean, he's going to spend most of what he makes just to make it a great event. Yeah. Um, and, and like the bonus package and I'm, I'm not trying to sell it just like, right. I mean, the, the bonus package is ridiculous. I have it broken out into, I think 11 items, um, but they're physically printing things. And um, it, really isn't 11 items it's more like 20 items and you know just the people who show up are going to walk away with you know this huge mass of bonuses and just that bill's going to cost a fortune for oh yeah <laughs> for all the people in the room so like you know it's it's expensive to attend but but it's it's going to be a stellar experience and and um brian's putting his all into making it very successful and and I mentioned this once before, but it's a, it's a tribute for Marty Edelston, mm -hmm. um, which is what's kind of made it so special and why so many people have kind of come out of the woodwork to participate. Marty founded Boardroom in 1972 and has basically worked with all the best people in direct marketing ever since then um, to build Boardroom into a $100 million plus a year direct marketing company. And um, it's... It's it's because of his relationship with those people. When he passed away last October, everybody just said, "Okay, if you're going to do something to honor Marty, like I'm, I'm really happy to be part of it. I want to be part of it. I want to participate." And um, 
and that's what's kind of turned it into this this once in a lifetime thing that it is. I mean, I've I've heard a lot of people on their own. Brian was saying this to begin with, is like trying to tell me the gravity of the event because as if I didn't recognize all the people speaking, but um, that that it's it's um, probably the best event since Ben Savinga's retirement sem- seminar, the Ben Savinga One Hundred. Um, and I've had other people say that on their own. You know, this is the biggest yeah. event since Ben Savinga One Hundred. Um, and and it, it certainly is going to be uh, something to remember for everybody it's there. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I have it in my notes here. Um, Titans 2014.net will redirect you. Yes. Uh, to to the sales letter. I have a tracking link just so I know who uh, who comes off a podcast versus <laughs> versus whatever. But Titans 2014.net. Um, yeah. It's it's um, that way you'll be able to to read all of Gary Bensavingo's wonderful copy and all of Dan Kennedy's yeah. wonderful positioning. And um, you know I wrote a little bit of the stuff too. So yeah. No, Roy, I appreciate it. You've been very generous with your time. Where so just tell people where they can find you. Where are, where are things that they should check out? Yeah, well, um, I have I have a bad habit of, of of putting information out online. So if you just search for me, it's a bad it's, habit. <laughs> yeah, it, it, no, it, well, it's it's a bad habit because I put stuff up online and then I don't maintain it very well. Um, <laughs> um, but this breakthrough marketing secrets. Yeah, because you have a couple of sites that I was yeah. reading. Yeah, I mean, I, I have I have my name. Um, that's just kind of meant to present my marketing services. Um, and my company name as well, um, which yeah. is something different. Um, but really the best place to come is BreakthroughMarketingSecrets.com. Mm-hmm. I know it's a long domain name, but um, somebody has, has the tagline, long name, amazing results. So I'll steal <laughs> that tagline, BreakthroughMarketingSecrets.com, long domain name, amazing results. You got it. <laughs> um, and that's where I publish my daily email. Um, I, I, I am implementing a brand new format next, next week, um, with mailbag Mondays where I answer people's questions, mm-hmm. readers questions, copy Tuesdays. I talk about everything related to copywriting web Wednesdays. Um, you know, what, what I've learned from selling tens of millions of dollars of, of products online, um, strategy Thursdays, because it's goes way beyond internet marketing, um, and grab bag Fridays, you know, anything that's going to be valuable to you. You have to um, play some of your electronic music, I think, that you create on grab bag Fridays because that's anything, right? There, there you go. I guess I guess I can I can make a justification for sharing electronic music yes. on Friday. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's um, and that, that's a little side thing, a side tangent that we didn't even really go down, but. Um, but yeah, I, I I have a lot of hobbies um, outside of marketing too, which keeps me uh, refreshed when I come back into marketing. Mm-hmm. Too. And uh-huh. so check out BreakthroughMarketingSecrets.com and Titans2014.net. And yeah. Roy, and that, yeah, go ahead. The, the Titans event is in September 2014. Just for yeah. people listening to the recording, it's September 11th and 12th uh, 2014 in Stamford, Connecticut, at the World Headquarters of Boardroom Inc. Um, so, um, you know, mark your calendars. <laughs> awesome. Roy, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Jeremy. All right. <laughs>